Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is synchronous motor starters. Our objective is to examine several types of synchronous motor starters on an introductory level. I'll try not to dive too deep into too many rabbit holes and keep this lecture brief and to the point. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewers watch the electrically excited synchronous motors lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only dimmer recall its contents, please bring yourself up to speed and return when you are so qualified. Recalling the aforementioned lecture, I briefly mentioned the complications of starting synchronous motors. Despite the advantages of synchronous motors, notably their ability to maintain constant speed inside their operational range and their ability to operate unity power factor given proper field current adjustment, starting a synchronous motor isn't as easy as one might initially suspect. One of the principal issues related to starting a synchronous motor is that upon closure of a full voltage starter, the state of rotating magnetic field is instantaneously established at full speed whereas the rotor and applied load with some level of static inertia may take some time to come up to this speed. This means the state of rotating magnetic field immediately overlaps the rotor and the rotor can't properly lock into the rotating magnetic field. This manifests itself as the motor exerting poor starting torque, drawing massive amounts of inrush and shaking. Don't believe me? Check this out. Oh, that's nasty. This is obviously not how you want to start a synchronous motor. Now realize I simultaneously energize both the stator and rotor in an unloaded condition with no counter torque. This gets so much worse with even a little bit of resistance. An apt analogy I use about starting a synchronous motor by improperly energizing the stator and the rotor at the same time is like having your buddy invite you to go water skiing only to have him pass you on the water at 60 miles per hour and toss you a rope and saying, let's go. It's going to rip your balls right out of your sockets if you try to accelerate that fast and there might be better ways to reach this velocity. If you think about it, there's really only two ways to solve the mismatch between the stator and rotor acceleration. Method one, slow the stator down, or method two, speed the rotor up. Method one, slow the stator down. This method is especially apt for permanent magnet synchronous motors since their rotor field isn't capable of being de-energized nor varied, but it also works with electrically excited synchronous motors if you're too lazy to turn the rotor field off. Give an energized rotor at rest, Rather than energizing the stator with a full voltage or direct online starter, one instead uses a variable frequency drive to slowly ramp up excitation frequency on the stator so the rotor is afforded a gentle means of acceleration from 0 to 10 Hz, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, and so on up to the base frequency of 60 or whatever speed you want it to run. Similarly, a motor drive could be used to ramp down excitation frequency for a gentle stop, which leads to method 2, speed the rotor up. There's a bunch of cunning ways to do this and they all amount to using some trickery to accelerate a de-energized rotor until it matches or at least gets close to synchronous speed and then energizing the rotor field which locks into the state of rotating magnetic field and the motor can be put to work. One of the simplest methods of properly starting a small synchronous motor is operating them as induction motors during the starting stage which accelerates the rotors to near synchronous speeds before turning on the exciter. This necessitates some modification of the rotor and that in addition to the field coil reserved for synchronous operation, the rotor also needs to include a cage-like structure characteristic of an induction motor for the momentary starting phase. These are called amortisseur or damper windings. Bonus points if you can pronounce amortisseur properly as I've yet to do so myself. You might see a timer or a rotational speed switch coordinating this transition from induction to synchronous operation. Consider a hardwire relay based ladder logic implementation of a synchronous motor starter with amortisseur windings employing a timer executing the on delay function. Viewers will recall an on delay function, sometimes called a delay on energize or DOE or slow operating or SO timer, exhibit a customizable delay between when the timer coil is energized and when the associated contacts change states. When the timer coil is energized, the associated normally closed contact remains closed and the normally open contact remains open. Only after the predetermined delay, TD is elapsed, does the normally closed contact open and the normally open contact close. When the timer coil is de-energized, the associated contacts immediately return to their deactivated states, i.e. the normally closed contact recloses and the normally open contact reopens. The primary circuit consists of the M stator contactor in series with the overload on the stator windings and DC rated field contactor F on the rotor. Key to this particular application is the controlled closure of the F field contactor. We first want to close the M contactor and energize the stator with the field contactor open such that amortisseur windings in the rotor are given a chance to accelerate the rotor to near synchronous speed. Then after a predetermined period of time, say 3 seconds has elapsed, 
close the field contactor since the rotor locks into the stator synchronous speed. The top three rungs of the pilot circuit largely concern the M contactor, whereas rungs four and five concern themselves with the timer and the field contactor. Rung one consists of the series combination of a normally closed e-stop, a normally closed stop, a normally open start, the coil of control relay CR1, and a normally closed thermal overload. All the normally closed devices serve to de-energize CR1 in the event of an operator-initiated stop, an emergency, or a sustained overload. An operator can start the system by pressing and releasing start, which energizes the coil of CR1. When CR1 energizes, its associated contacts in rungs 2, 3, and 4 simultaneously change states. CR1 in rung 2 closes and establishes a holding circuit, allowing the operator to release start. CR1 in rung 3 closes and energizes the M primary contactor coil. The M contactor closes and the motor starts. Importantly, the motor starts without the rotor field being energized since the field contactor is open. The motor starts in induction mode, exerting reasonable starting torque and inrush with no vibrations. The motor accelerates to just shy of synchronous speed in the no-load condition. Simultaneously, CR1 in rung 4 closes and energizes the coil of timer TR1, executing the on-delay, delay-on-energize, or slow operating function. As such, its associated contacts, notably TR1 and rung 5, remains open and the aft coil remains de-energized. This being said, the clock is running, giving the rotor time to accelerate. Three seconds later, the timer completes the on-delay function. Tier 1 and rung 5 changes state and energizes the F contactor coil. The field contactor closes and energizes the rotor field, which locks into the stator rotating magnetic field suitable for constant speed operation, characteristic of a synchronous motor. An operator wishing to stop the system reset to the starting state would press and release stop. Here's a real-time simulation of this circuit using Automation Studio. Before we begin, I wanted to mention that the circuit simulations and schematics in this lecture were created using Automation Studio, a product of FAMIC Technologies. If you need more information about Automation Studio, visit their website at www.famictech.com. As we illustrated in the walkthrough, an operator presses and releases start to close the M contactor, establish a holding circuit, and start the timer. Three seconds later, the timer reaches its count and closes the field contactor and energizes the rotor field. As we anticipated, the motor starts in induction mode using the amortizer windings in the rotor, and after a predetermined delay, allowing a degree of acceleration, the field contactor closes and energizes the rotor field, which locks into the state of rotating magnetic field suitable for constant speed operation, characteristic of a synchronous motor. Here's the system in operation once again. You note this method is pretty simple, suitable for smaller motors only, and since it's making its decision on time only, doesn't ever verify if the rotor actually has accelerated near synchronous speed before it closes the field contactor. For this reason, instead of a timer, you might see a rotational speed switch or other sensory device in charge of the field contactor, only closing it when it's really appropriate to do so. Even more robust implementations might incorporate both sensory devices and timers to not only verify if the rotor is actually at the appropriate speed, but also call it off if it's taken too long. We'll examine a more robust circuit in an upcoming application. Here's an entirely manual implementation of a synchronous motor starter using amortizer windings. When I energize the stator field only, the cage-like amortizer windings act like the cage of a squirrel cage induction motor and the motor accelerates to near synchronous speed. When it's close enough, I energize the rotor field winding and the rotor locks into the stator and starts turning at synchronous speed. Moving on. Another popular method commonly used to start a synchronous motor is to, believe it or not, use another motor or mechanical means like a gas-powered engine, a hydraulic motor, or a domestic animal to accelerate an unloaded rotor to near synchronous speed before turning on the exciter. You think I'm joking about the animals, but I'm not. This method is called a pony motor for valid historical reasons. A pony motor is essentially a small motor used to simply get the rotor turning, not to do any actual work. Consider some giant 1,000 horsepower synchronous motor with a large number of pole pairs suitable for exerting high torque at low speeds. Such a massive rotor would have obvious difficulties accelerating at synchronous speed. For this reason, a smaller induction style or a DC motor mounted on the same shaft is energized and used to get just the rotor turning. Once accelerated to near synchronous speed, the rotor field is energized, which locks into the state of rotating magnetic field. At this time, the pony motor is de-energized and the synchronous motor can then be put to work turning an entire dug fur into a bag of bark chips or whatever it's supposed to do. Long story short, stator and pony motor on, DC exciter off. When the rotor is close to synchronous speed, 
The stator stays on, but the pony motor and DC exciter perform a coordinated handoff to pony motor off and DC exciter on. DC style pony motors can also serve as an additional capacity. As with three phase AC machines, there are DC motors and DC generators. Given an electrically excited synchronous motor necessitates DC for the rotor field, oftentimes the shaft mounted DC motor, once it has served its initial purpose of accelerating the rotor to near synchronous speed, can be repurposed as a DC generator and supply the necessary DC field current to the synchronous motor rotor. In this capacity, the exciter circuit itself can govern when it is appropriate to energize the field or not. I feel this application needs a little explanation since most textbooks I've encountered dedicate a single diagram and a short paragraph at most describing its operation. Into the rabbit hole we go. By the time I wrap this up, we might have to rename this lecture synchronous motor starters, synchronous motor exciters, and synchronous motor protection mechanisms.